Hallelujah. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Okay, so let's wake up a bit, put your hands together and give God some glory. Hallelujah. I don't know, sometimes I talk to the church like I have just spoken, and people interpret that to mean a buff. That's not a buff. That's an encouragement to be the people that God wants us to be. Don't take it personal, okay? I have your best interest at heart. And I quite understand you will misunderstand sometimes, and I'll tell you about it during the course of this message. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of John chapter 15. And while you're there, you can put a marker, probably a finger, in James chapter 1. We will be running across there briefly. John chapter 15. And I will be ministering to us this morning by the Spirit of God on a very familiar text. That's been preached here many times before. But God can use the same text to reveal different truths to us. As we grow, the scripture grows with us. The same verses can tell us much more than it did yesterday. So don't think that, oh gosh, not again. John 15, fruits, bearing fruit. Don't think like that, okay? Let's hear what God has to say. John 15 verses one. I am the true vine, Jesus says, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. I want us to take note of that, because that's where the message is going this morning. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he take it away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot be a fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. He's not speaking about the men that will be burned because they're not, he's using this as an allegory of what exactly happens with a branch, a natural branch that doesn't bring forth fruit. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so that you may be my disciples. As the Father had loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might be, remain in you, and that your joy 
might be full. You have not, verse 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. Take note of that. And that your fruit will remain. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Many messages from this particular allegory, and that's what it is, is an allegory. Jesus is using a natural vine to make a spiritual point, a divine point. Many of, um, th this text has been preached many times, and it will possibly be preached many more times. Why? Because as we can clearly see here in this text, Jesus is not only interested in fruit. He's not only interested in fruit. Fruit is good. But I have gleaned from the text that he's interested in more fruit and much fruit. So if we are at the point of bearing fruit, and if you are in this church, you should be a fruit bearer. Should be. If you are at the point of bearing fruit, whilst that is good in the eyes of God, understand through his word that he doesn't want you to stay there. He wants you to bear more fruit. And as you bear more fruit, he wants you to bear even much more fruit. And the message will tell you why this is so. As we have seen in verse 2, when fruit is born, the vine, Jesus said, is purged so that it may bring forth more fruit. He doesn't leave the vine there with its fruit. He does something to the vine so that the vine will bring forth more fruit. And what he does to the vine, the Bible tells us, he purges it. We know that this was an allegory that Jesus used in reference to us as believers. We know that. So it is easy to glean from verse 2 that God our Father desires that we be not content with what fruit we are bearing, but we ought to bear more fruit. That is desirable to him. And it is for that very purpose the branch, meaning us as believers, is purged. Jesus further tells us in verse 8 that the Father is glorified when we bear fruit. Is that so? Is it on the board? Are you reading that? Hearing is my Father glorified that you bear fruit? Ah. Hearing is my Father glorified when we bear much fruit. And as we go down to verse 16, we are told that we have, we did not choose him, but he chose us and ordained us to go and bring forth fruit that our fruit will remain. Is that what you see there? That your fruit will remain. I'm putting emphasis on certain aspects of the text because that's what the message is all about. Not just bearing fruit, but bearing more fruit 
bearing much fruit. And in order to do that, the vine will be purged. And as we bear much fruit, the Father is glorified. And when he is glorified, he will give us what we ask. Verse 16, are you seeing that there? You see, it is one thing to just read and go over the text. But it's another thing to allow the Holy Spirit of God to bring these truths to us. And this is what the preaching of the word is all about. You may not be able to get that until you hear it preached. And that's why he gave some to be apostles, prophets, and evangelists, pastors, and teachers for this very purpose, for the building up of the saints of God. So we have a great promise here that what we ask of the Father, he will give it to us. How many of you have been asking of the Father? All of us have been. Have we been getting everything that we ask? No. Is it because we are just fruit bearers and we are not bearing more fruit and much fruit? Well, God is interested in more fruit and much fruit so that he would be glorified, so that he in turn would be able to give us that which we ask. Is that the word of God? That's what I see in the word of God by the spirit of God. So he has a great promise for us. Can you imagine? So important it is to God that we bear much fruit, that Jesus promises that the Father will give us what we ask of him. I choose to believe the word of God as it is written. Jesus says that, I believe it, and it settles it for me. So my thing is, if I'm going to go to the Father with expectation, then I'm going to make sure that I am not just a fruit bearer, but that I am going to press on to bearing more fruit and much fruit. But we have to understand that this is not going to happen automatically. Not because we come to Holiness Revival Ministries, we will move from fruit to more fruit and much fruit. Something has to happen. God has to intervene in our fruit bearing so that we will bear more fruit and much fruit. I see that in the scriptures. And what is it that God has to do? He has to purge the vine. Are you with me this morning? So there's a condition to the promise. It's not just a blank check signed for us. There is a condition that we, that our fruit will remain. In other words, that the fruit that you bear will not fall off the branch when contrary winds blow. You know what happens when high wind blows and there is fruit on a tree? Some fall off because they are not attached as they should. And most of them are forced ripe fruit. They fall off. But God says, your fruit must remain. It's so easy when negative situations arise against us, especially when other persons are involved that the fruit we would have labored so hard to bear will suddenly drop off the vine as soon as adversity comes, especially when people are involved. For example, this text talks a lot about love. We didn't read about it, but it talks about love. So we're going to talk about love as a fruit of the Spirit. 
because Galatians 5 tells us that the fruit of the Spirit, and it begins with love. So we're going to use love as an, as an example. The wise man Solomon, in Ecclesiastes 9.11, he says, in effect, that life and chance happens to all. Life and chance happens to all. In one way or the other, what life doesn't take up, chance will take up. And when it does, we begin to treat the person that we say we love in all kinds of hurtful ways just to get even because of what they may have done or didn't do for us in our lives. We have borne, we have labored to bear this fruit of love. But time and chance happens. And as a result, the love that we have labored to bear so much, it falls off. Because we can't say we love and we're treating the person in all kinds of ungodly ways. We can't say we love and we are hurting the person that we say we love. God tells us very, very clearly in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, love, which is a fruit of the Spirit, suffers long and is kind. Love suffereth long and is kind, does not behave itself unseemly, is not self-seeking, it does not insist on its own way, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, that is it does not take into account the evil that has been done to it, Bear it all things, endure it all things. So when life and chance happens in our life, and we say we love, but these things are not applicable in our relationship to the one we say we love, then the fruit didn't remain. It fell off as a result of adversity. But what did Jesus say in John 15, 16? You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you shall go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit shall remain. God is not interested in fruit that hangs for today and falls for tomorrow. According to what I read in the word of God. So I've just used love as an example because Galatians 5 one talks about, you know, the fruit of the spirit and it begins with love. We must understand love is not a feeling. It's an action and one that brings glory to God. Love is not a feeling. There are feelings of love, but love is not a feeling. It's an action. For God so feely love you. No, you ain't feel anything. It's unconditional love. It's an action word. And it's a thing that brings glory 
to the God. So I cannot in my wildest imagination understand why anyone who is born of the Spirit of God will so live that I will so live and not want to bring forth fruit or to even bring forth more fruit. I never understand that. When it is evident from our text that Jesus put such great importance on fruit bearing, we saw that as we read over and over. He started off with fruit and he went to more fruit and then much fruit, giving promises, saying that the Father is glorified. So we must understand that God puts a very high premium on this question of fruit bearing. And I'll tell you why later. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you now. Fruit is the quality of Christian character or spiritual virtues that bring glory to God through life and is a witness that makes Christ real to others. It is the visible evidence of God working in us and through us. I'm going to read that again for you. Got it from heaven. Fruit is the quality of Christian character or spiritual virtues that bring glory to God. We saw that in the text through our lives. And it is a witness that makes Christ real to others. Why? It is the visible evidence of God working in us and through us. There are many, many people in this world today that say they are Christians. But Jesus said, not me. Jesus is the one that said it. He says, it is by their fruit, not what they profess, not what they say, not how they look. It is by their fruit you will know them. And my take is, if I am bearing fruit, and my fruit don't remain because someone does me something and I choose to let myself, my, my fruit go, then I can't see that being glorifying to God. So it is the visible evidence of God working through us and the Father is glorified. Jesus said it. And the Father is glorified because when his children, when as his children we reflect his characteristics, we become effective tools as witnesses in his hands. Yes, we want to go and be a witness outside and tell people about the Lord. But that witness must first be in us. They must see the Christ in us for us to convince them that Jesus is the Christ. And this is what Jesus meant in Matthew 5, 16 when he said, let your light so shine about men that they may see your good works. The good works spoken of here is the characteristics of Christ flowing through you. Not just necessarily going and feeding the poor, although that is a great thing. But there are people who feed the poor who don't know Christ. So it is not just that. Let your light so shine about all men that they might see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. 
Can I say with you, to you this morning with all certainty that when the Father is glorified as sons and daughters, we are going to be satisfied. That's a little caption we have somewhere in our house. When God is glorified, the servant is satisfied. Now while Galatians 5, 23 tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and temperance, we should not think that that is an exhaustive listing. We should not think that that is an exhaustive listing. If we do, we may stop just there bearing fruit. But God wants us to bear more fruit and he wants us to bear much fruit. So we should not think that that Galatians 5 is exhaustive. Let's look at some other texts this morning. Try to do it quickly. Ephesians 5, 8 to 10. For you were sometimes in darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit, remember Galatians says the fruit of the Spirit is? For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness. In all goodness. And righteousness and truth proving or finding out what is acceptable unto the Lord so the Spirit of God will want to take us into bearing more fruit but he has to do something with us to bring us to that place The Amplified Version says, The fruit of the Spirit consists in every form of goodness and righteousness, that is uprightness of heart and the truth, trying to learn by our own experience what is acceptable to God. Colossians 1, 9 and 10. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, that is their faith in Christ, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you walk, that you might walk, that is live and conduct yourself worthy of the Lord all, unto all pleasing or fully pleasing to him, being what? fruitful in every good work and increasing or growing in the knowledge of Christ. It is not just Galatians 5. I'll give you one more. 2 Peter 1, 3. And besides all this, giving all diligence add to your faith is faith a fruit of the Spirit, faithfulness, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love or charity. For if these things be in you and abound in you, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I rest my case. It is not just Galatians 5 that tells us what the fruit of the Spirit is all about. So we can glean, clearly see, the listing of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians is indeed not just Galatians 5. 
This further adds to the fact that the fruit bearing is vitally important to God and ourselves by extension, and ourselves. It's not just important to God, it's important to us because it opens the way for us to ask what we will and the Father will give it to us because he is glorified when we bear more fruit and much fruit and that our fruit remains and that our fruit remains so important. The written word of God gives us one way that we can bear more fruit and much fruit. It is so important that God has made different avenues through which we can bear fruit, more fruit. He has made different avenues so that we can move from fruit bearing to bear more fruit and much fruit. One of those ways is the written word of God, the logos. As we study the word of God and apply the things we understand to our lives and apply the things we understand to our lives, fruit will be born. As we apply the things we understand, you're not going to understand everything in the word of God. If you would understand everything in the word of God, I have no job. <laughs> Preachers out. But the spirit of God illuminates and we are able to bring to you what is more than the natural eye can see. So whatever you read and you understand, you must apply. And if you apply, fruit will be born. That's one way. When we don't understand, the preaching of the word inspires fruit bearing when we are doers of the word that we hear and not hearers only. That's the second way. By the preaching of the word. We don't understand. We can't glean all that you're hearing now from just reading this text. But you're getting a little more now through the preached word because it is inspired by the spirit of God. And... By the preached word, because it is inspired by God, if you are doers of the word and not just a hearer, it's going to stimulate you to bring forth more fruit and even much fruit, as you are hearing this morning. Another method that God uses is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The conviction of the Holy Spirit. Fruit can be born as we adhere. You see, we have a part to play in it. God has his part and we have a part. We have to apply. We have to not be just hearers. We have to be doers. And in this case, we have to adhere to the conviction of the Holy Ghost. What God will have us do and not what we want to do. Are you listening to me this morning? Fruit can be born as we adhere to the conviction and do what God will have us do and not hold on to that which we want to do as we sometimes do. God, by his spirit, may be convicting us about something. 
But we want to hold on to that to something. We are not adhering to the conviction. We can't go beyond that. To go beyond that would be to bring forth more fruit. But if we hold on to where we want to be and not what God requires of us, then we are stymied. We're not bringing forth anything more. And don't think that this thing of fruit bearing is for how long you come into church, you know. It's a life long thing. I might tell it this way, it looks like God is never satisfied. <laughs> he just wants us to bear more and more and more because the more fruit we bear, it's the more we become like him. every instance, fruit will only be born as we apply ourselves to the requirements of God for our lives. It is not going to happen automatically. So having said all that, I want us to go back to verse 2. Let's go back to verse 2. Where it says, where Jesus says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he take it away. He's using this in the natural sense. And every branch that beareth fruit, he's now talking about this in a spiritual sense, you and me. And every branch that beareth fruit, he does what? He purchases it. He purchases it. For what reason? That it may bring forth more fruit. So as I said before, God does not only want us to bear fruit, but he wants us to bear more fruit and much fruit. And according to Jesus in verse 8, this is what glorifies the Father so that the Father will give us what we ask. Are you with me? So let's little look at this thing called purge. I don't know about you, but growing up as a child, every time school closes and, oh, it happened to you too. <laughs> Before you go back out to school, it's castor oil, sene, or what? So Epsom, oh Jesus. You have to take a purge. You have to get out all the old stuff you eat during the holiday. Start getting clean. Well, that's the same word Jesus used. If you go to other translations, you would see pruned. But I like to stay with the King James. Prune song like, you know, Prune, but purge is, is cut away. And every branch in me that brings forth fruit, not the branches that not bring in forth fruit. Yeah, I have time with that. Every branch in me that brings forth fruit. Are you a fruit bearer this morning? Let me see your hands. We should all be if we're coming to this church. But look at what Jesus says. He's going to purge you. I'm purging a nice. How I many of you love your purge? <laughs> you can like castor oil? You ever smell castor oil? Hold your nose, open your mouth. Sinner. Oh, these days we could take some tablet or you know and solid but in those days that's what Jesus is talking about them days purge <laughs> the concise Oxford English dictionary 
defines purge as ridding of unwanted feeling or conditions. If you have a Oxford, an Oxford English, concise Oxford English dictionary, check it out. Purge define ridding of an unwanted feeling or condition. The online dictionary to rid of whatever is impure or undesirable. However you turn it, it means the same thing. Getting rid of something that should not be there. Purge. If you would just think of a tree being purged, we're going to use the term prudent there. When the prudent hook is used, it does one of two things. It hooks, pulls, and tear away. Or, they call it a cocoa knife sometimes, eh? it, you trust and you, you cut off. Could you imagine a vine and it's being purged when that knife passes across? If it had feelings like you and me, it would be screaming to high heavens. It would be painful. It would not feel nice. But if you are a fruit bearer, the time will come when you are going to be purged in one way or another. As it is in the natural, so it is in the spirit. If the vine could boil, sometimes we can boil. But it's all for our good to bring forth fruit so that the Father is glorified, so that we can ask what we will, and the Father will give it to us. That's what Jesus says. I did not say that. Jesus said it. So how does God purge so that we can bear more fruit and much fruit? Simply put, the method he used is called tests. I see a lot of smiling feet. I like to, when you see when I talk about tests and you smile, I love to see that. This is nice. It don't feel nice, but it's good. He tests us so that we will bear more fruit and further tests us that we bear much fruit. And for as long as you live, as long as I live, the tests will keep on coming because he wants us to bear so much fruit that we are going to be replicas of himself. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestine that we be conformed to the image of Jesus, so that Jesus would be the firstborn among many brethren. Romans 8, 29. These tests are not for him to know how we will handle them. He would already have known how we will do. Huh? Because he is omniscient. He, he knows exactly what's happening when we go through these tests. It is for him to let us know. It is for him to let us know where we are in terms of fruit bearing by virtue of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You know, we are not, we don't have any excuse at all, you know. We have everything. 
He has given us everything that pertains to godliness. Everything. So, we want to remember that fruit is the quality of Christian character or spiritual virtues that bring glory to God through life and is a witness that makes Christ real to others. I'll explain that last part a little more at the end of the message. So that God will test us in varying ways for the express purpose of exercising us in developing our fruit-bearing capacity. Each and every one of us have been given a capacity to bear fruit by God. He knows the capacity and he knows how often he's going to purge us to bring forth more fruit and when he's going to be satisfied with our fruit, which is never, and then stop. Let's look at James chapter 1. James, the brother of Jesus Christ, natural brother, by mother only. He says in verse 2, my brethren, who is he talking about? The people in the world? No, he's talking to you and to me, brothers in Christ Jesus. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into varying kinds of trials. Any of you ever counted joy? But you see, he didn't say it's a joyful thing. He never said that. He said we must count it, consider it as a joy. But he's mad. <laughs> no, he's not. He's the brother of Jesus Christ. He gives the reason why. He says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith does what? What is patience? Not a fruit? Isn't it a fruit? The trying of your faith. When your faith is being sorely tried, you are being purged. You are being purged of something. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect word that you may be perfect. That's mature, eh? not perfect in the sense of without fault. We never be like that. We will be mature and entire, wanting nothing. Wanting nothing. Nothing. So, James is saying, you're a fruit bearer, brethren. Listen, God wants to work something more in you. So what's going to happen is, he's going to purge you. You're going to have a trial. You're going to have a trial that will make you want to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Putting it mildly. And how you bend, so you go. If you go God's way, you be a fruit. Wanting nothing. If you go the other way, satisfying your own feelings, your own desires, what you want to do and not what God wants you to do, what's going to happen? No fruit. Remember, you are a fruit bearer already, and God loves you and He's happy that you're bearing fruit, but He wants to do more in your life, give you more fruit. So that's just an example, a typical example of how God purges. So there are many kinds of tests. 
Many, many kinds. I, if I go to tell you all the tests that we would have to go through in this life, we would all have to fall asleep right here and wake up right here. So I'm just going to give you a, a, one or two examples of the kinds of tests that we go through. I chose this one not by inspiration of God, but I chose it because of what God said to me one day. Not this one. I'll give you the, the one just now. There's first the obedience test. That's a test. Huh? God will test us in our obedience to him. He gives his word and he's going to test us at his word. Everything you hear from behind this pulpit, I wouldn't say because it comes out, as it comes out of the, it comes out of the word of God if it comes from this pulpit. Everything you hear that God requires of you, you are going to be tested about it. Everything. So there's a test called the obedience test. You may have been obedient to the word of God in some ways, and you are a fruit bearer. Praise God. But the Father wants you to bear much more fruit so that he can be glorified through you, so that you can ask what you will, and he can give it. You can bless you as a result. So God will use difficult situations in your life and require you to handle it in a way of obedience to his word. He will require you in this difficult situation that you are faced with, a situation you never thought will come about in your life, he's going to use that situation to test your obedience to his word. Will you respond to his word and do his word in spite of how you may feel or how you may think, or what others may say, you're going to do it God's way. That is the obedience test. It can be very, very hard. Sometimes it can be very, very hard to obey God. But praise God when we do, it work at the peaceable work of righteousness in us. So even though it is hard, nonetheless, if you yield to his way, you pass the obedience test in this respect, and you grow, and you develop, and you bear more fruit. So the purging is through the obedience test. If on the other hand you are adamant and choose to stick to your way because of how you feel and not yield to God's way, then you would have chosen to remain with the little fruit that you have. You little chinky. What's the smallest fruit you can think of? Instead of you bearing a nice fat breadfruit, you have a little cherry hanging on your vine. You know, <laughs> you have a little cherry, I'm a fruit bearer. <laughs> and somebody passing by you and showing you the bread food. We got to do it God's way. In spite of how we feel. In spite of what we think. In spite of who, what others may say. Let God have his way. It may not, it might be tight, but it is right to do it God's way. Oh, if I had time, I would give you some testimonies on that, but I can't. So that if you don't do it God's way, you would have chosen that your fruit will not remain. The little fruit that you have, that's what it's going to be. And you deny God being glorified through you. So are we understanding the concept of purging? This is what I want to get across to you by the Spirit of God this morning. 
Then there's this test called the misunderstanding test. That's the one I chose to bring to you, not that God inspired it specifically. Why? I told you this before, sometime, if you were here. I was coming to the office one morning, minding my own business, which is God's business anyway, and I just heard, people will misunderstand you. I mean, if you remember me telling you that before. Yeah, I told you, you don't have good memories. People will misunderstand you. So I smiled. I knew it's God. I smile and I says, how so, Lord? He says, because you say the things I want you to say, but they don't see me, they see you. And I thought that was so profound. So I just started to laugh heartily. Heartily because God has informed me that people will misunderstand me and told me why. Because I am saying what he wants me to say, and, but they're not seeing him, they're seeing me. I thought that was so funny. So I chose misunderstanding because have any one of you ever never have been misunderstood? Let me see your hands. All of us at some time or another. But the question is, how do we handle misunderstanding? How do we handle it? And let me tell you up front, it may be somewhere in my notes, I don't know. I don't stick to my notes. Let me tell you something in up, front, up front, that God at times will orchestrate these things. Remember, it's a test. He's putting us to a test. And if nothing is happening along the way that he wants to test us with, he's going to orchestrate it. Go and read Job. Who was behind the scenes orchestrating all that was happening? It's God. He talked to the devil and said, go ahead. Just don't touch his life. Do what you want, man. So God or a situation may develop that there is misunderstanding. What happens when we are misunderstood by others? If there is some degree of offense taken, which generally is the case, by the person who misunderstands, and there are hurt feelings, rather than run telling others what they feel about the person. And I often wonder when this happens, what is the intention behind it? Is it to make the person whom you have misunderstood bad in the eyes of people? Why, why, why go and tell others? about the person to which, whom you have misunderstanding. Why say things about them? What they should have done? What they didn't do? Why? See, this is the human nature. This is the fallen nature that God wants to purge. So he's going to let misunderstanding, he's going to make it come about. He's going to advocate it. But we must know from the word of God what God requires when misunderstandings come. Rather than run around telling others what the person has done to you or have not done for you, as the case may be, instead of that, and in spite of your hurt feelings, we are talking now of pruning or purging to bear more fruit. Instead of doing that, you choose, you choose to bear your hurt and first go to the person with whom you have the misunderstanding and clear up the issue. You do it this way, you know what happened? A whole bunch of fruit. 
a whole bunch born one time. You be, listen now, man. You be a whole set of fruit right there in the eyes of God. Why? Because you do it God's way. Isn't that what Jesus says in Matthew 5? You have ought. Don't come to the altar and bring gift for me. Leave it there. Go settle it with the brother. And then bring your gift. So misunderstandings will come. God will make sure they will come. But we must know what God requires of us and do what God requires of us and not moved by our own fallen nature feelings. He used situations like this to purge. So that if you did it God's way, you would have moved from bearing fruit because it's a fruit bearer that he's purging. From bearing fruit to bear more fruit. So God will use misunderstanding. There are many more tests that God will use to put. We can't go through them now. I see my time is up. But he will use frustration. Frustration. God will cause situations in your life. He will bring people around you to frustrate the hell out of you. I literally mean that. Because there is hell in us. Paul says it. There is no good thing in me. So he will bring people. And I will... Repeat it to frustrate the hell out of you so that heaven could come in. <laughs> I'm going to tell my young ministers, be careful eh, when you don't come up here and say them things without before thinking about it and understanding what you're saying. Eh? People, listen. There's a misunderstanding taking place right here now. Somebody go in and tell people, Pastor, this cuss me the pulpit. <laughs> there is no good thing. There are hellish things in us that God wants to take out. And he will use these things to purge the hell out of us. It's simple. It's not a figure of speech. He wants to take the hell out of us. So he will use the frustration test. He'll use discouragement as a test. Oh, God. I live in that test. I live in that test. Disappointment, discouragement. Once you're dealing with people, as I told a group last Sunday, people will be people and as long as you're dealing with people there's going to be disappointment there's going to be discouragement but we must know how to handle it if you react in the flesh the old man no food whatever food you had drop off and remain but if you handle it in a godly way Understanding that God is testing. Brother Glenroy remarked it the other day about the remark I once made that I smile and laugh when things come my way because I see it as an opportunity to bear fruit. Some people I see them as manure. Why are you laughing? No, don't, don't misunderstand me. Manure is fertilizer. But you are different kinds of fertilizers to accomplish different purposes. And I know the purpose God wants to accomplish when that person comes around me. 
it can't be some other kind of fertilizer. It has to be manure because there's a particular fruit that has to be born in me. You understand what I'm saying? So when, when you see it like that, you don't rile up against the person. And you, you see them as opportunity. <laughs> Ah, Jesus. <laughs> Any kind of test that will purge what self wants to do rather than what God wills that we do, the concept of purging, purging is the same. You're bearing fruit, he wants more fruit. He established that in his word, so he's going to purge. So that when life and time happens to us in any way untoward, let us look at it as a purging opportunity to move from bearing fruit to bearing more fruit and much fruit. Not forgetting, not forgetting that that is what God desires of us so that he is glorified through us so that he can give us what we ask. Remembering fruit is the quality of Christian character or spiritual virtues that bring glory to God through lies and is a witness that makes Christ real to others when they see in you what only Christ can do for you. That is fruit bearing. God bless you richly and I'll see you around. When they see in you, let's stand. When they see in you what only Christ can do through you. You can't do it on your own, but he can do it to you if you so yield yourself. Hallelujah. Let's sing this chorus.
Father, my heart's cry to you this morning is that we, your people, who have heard this word, whether here or through the media, that we would all aspire, Lord, not just to be fruit bearers, but to allow you to so work in our lives and to so yield to your work in our lives that new blossoms will begin to bloom so that more fruit and much fruit can be born in our lives so that we can reflect who you are to the world so that when the world can see who you really are what your characteristics are what your attributes are and compare it to what is we would become true witnesses of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ I pray Lord that blossoms will begin to bloom so that more fruit will be born amongst us myself included of course and I pray this in Jesus name Amen and amen. God bless you richly. You may be seated.